guys. Good to see you guys. We have we, half the crowds here because the other half is in um, up north, I mean, not north, up in LA. They're having their leadership retreat as we speak right now. So uh, uh, it's been going good. It's been going well. Um, last time, can, you, can we um, can you try to sit a little bit up a little bit, please? If you guys can, just kind of one row up, please. One row up. <laughs> one row. One out. One. Come on, Lily. Come on, girls. Come on. One row up just to give me some, you know, feel like you want to be here, you know, with me and everything. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. (laughs) All right. It's good to see you guys. You good over there, tech team? Yeah? Yeah? Hey, give some love to the youth group. They, uh, They are holding down the fort while the rest of them fools are up there, right? All right, so, that's some love. All right, uh, so this is their second time listening to the message, so, you know, they should be like pro by, uh, by now. Uh, and we are in a, a series called Raw Humanity. Raw Humanity, it is a, it's a series in the book of Psalm, and what it, what the hope of it is to entail this, this passion is hard for us to cry out to God, to pray. Pray in honest, in earnest, earnesty, right, before the Lord. Pray in such a way where we are, we're expressing our real emotions. We're not just um, putting words out there. We're not just throwing random things. But we're actually uh, confessing and, and contemplating and, and celebrating and being able to cry out and complaints to God and be actually be real with Him, right? Um, and today, one of the things that I feel like is so beneficial, so, uh, so important in our prayer life is the prayer of thanksgiving, the ability to pray in a way where you are thankful to God, right? And this is hard because we're not very, we, we're used to thanking God when good things happen, right? Because it's great, like, oh, thank God, kind of as a side note, thank you for kind of throwing that in there. But we, we, we fail sometimes to thank God even when bad things happen because we can't possibly imagine why these things are happening at this situation, right? And why would anyone want to give thanks to God in the midst of those things? I want to share with you guys today that there is ability, there is a way for you to pray to give thanks to God. And there is a way for you to do it in such a way where it will actually grow you, it will teach you, and it will actually transform the way you think and the way you see your, your present circumstances. Right? So that's what we're going to go into today. We're going to talk about a prayer of thanksgiving. Okay? Let me share with you the story first, though. I was, um, so if you guys know, in college, I was in this group called uh, uh, Korean Campus Crusade for Christ. And every summer, what we would do, right, what we would do is we would go on a mission trip. And one of the things that we'll do, we'll stop in Korea for a little bit uh, as we kind of like adjust ourselves. And in Korea, they have this program, not this program, but this, this, this thing that we did. It's called um, Beggar's Retreat. And what they do is they grab a bunch of us. They get half of our team, which is about three or four uh, Western American kids. And they grab about three or four uh, Korean uh, college kids. And they put them together. And they throw them out in the middle of the countryside with a backpack on with no money. And basically, we have to travel four days to survive. Okay? We have four days of survival, no money, and our way of surviving is basically coming to houses, asking if we can you know, help and support them or you know, do some chores for them, present for them the gospel, and then afterwards ask them if they can feed us and house us. That was our way of surviving. That was a way of testing faith, right? testing our, our, our willingness to do we trust God that he's going to actually get us through this whole journey. Right? And I remember, I remember my first time because it was the worst experience of my life, right? It was, it was the worst time, it was the worst experience of my life, because here we are, we're, we're, paired, we're, we're teamed up with about four uh, Korean students, college students, who speak very minimal English, and I'm the, I'm the Vietnamese kid who speaks no Korean, right? And my other teammates who, like, are just horrible at translating. So it's, just, it's, it's already bad as it is, okay? And the first thing that happens is we get on the bus to get transported to our spot, okay? We got on the wrong bus, and we went we went to the wrong location, so we had to walk seven miles to the start of our beginning of our location. So you can imagine, here we are, like eight of us walking through the countryside with our backpacks, seven miles, and it's humid, it's Korean summer, and it's hot, and the whole time, but this is, and every team has a, have what they call a father and a mother uh, teammate, so basically their job is to take care of the team. If anything happens, it's their fault, right? So there was this, there was this lady, there was the, 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 the mom of the team, and the whole time we were walking, she kept saying, you know, thank you, Jesus. Right? And I'm, like, I'm walking, I'm like, mm-mm. <laughs> I mean, I, it's like, I don't know what you're seeing, but I don't see. But there's nothing to be thankful about right now because it is hot, right? We're walking. We get to this place. 
And as we get there, guess what happens? The, it, things just keep getting worse. It started to rain, okay? And so, again, we're at the beginning of our location, okay? We're already, like, like you know, like a couple hours off. We're at the beginning of our location, and we have to go find houses to, one, house us, ask them, can we stay here? Bunch of strangers, right? Can we stay? And also, can you feed us, you know, while we're here? You know, so it starts to rain, and now so the team decides we're going to split up into, like, you know, pairs. And, of course, God jokingly paired me up with the mom, right? Because she thought, you know, it would be nice. You know, know the kid who can't speak that much uh, Korean, and she can speak, you know, basic English. So, you know, it will be, be good, and she can take care of you. I'm like, all right, I was the youngest on the team. So here we are. We're walking, walking with her, and it's raining. It's pouring. And I'm like, this sucks. This sucks so bad, right? We got to the first house. And the first house, this guy came out, and he just basically, I don't even know Korean, but I'm pretty sure he cussed at her, right? He, he, just, he just went off on her, like, da 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 da. And she looked, she looked, and she's like, mm, right? And she walked away, and I was like, dude, that sucks, right? She says, thank you, Jesus, right? And I'm like, this girl is crazy. This girl, <laughs> this, I, out of all the teammates I got paired up, I, I got paired up with the crazy one, right? So she said, like, thank you, Jesus. And I was walking with her, and then, of course, of course, she slips, and she twists her ankle, okay? And so you can imagine, you know, like, you see this kind of scene in the Korean drama, right, where the guy picks up the girl and kind of carries her, right? That was it. That was it. I had a backpack on. I can't, but it was not as romantic as you think it was, okay? You're slushing in the rain, right, and you're walking with her on your, I'm walking with her, and those movies or those shows, they, they make you seem like the guy can walk forever. The truth is you can't, okay? I was in college. I think I was kind of fit. You can walk maybe, like, half a mile, and that's, like, dead right there, right? I was, like, carrying her. I was, like, she was a skinny girl, so I was, like, dang, you are. I mean, first, like, you know, first quarters, I go, okay, but as you keep walking, I said, girl, you're getting heavy, right? <laughs> this, is, this is getting bad. And then the whole time, you know, she got off. We finally made up with the rest of the team. We found a place. It was great, right? And I, I thought, you know, because she, you know, she was getting this habit of voice saying, thank, thank you, Jesus. So I was thinking, oh, you know, say thank you, Tony, because I just carried you, you know, half a mile, right? She got down. She says, thank you, Jesus. And I'm like, and, right? And she says, thank you, Jesus, right? And so finally, finally, when we're, we're finally dry, we're in this house, uh, the, the father of the team found this place for us. We're, we're basically in the shed, okay? It looks like we're about to get butchered because it's like it's one of those sheds that has all the tools around it, and we're just sleeping on the ground. It's just really weird, okay? So we're in the shed, and I finally asked her, okay, look, maybe it's a Korean thing, right? I know we're all Christians, but, like, like do you have, like, an, like, do you always say thank you, Jesus, for everything? And I think God has his way of always bringing me to people who tells me things that are so cryptic that I don't understand, right? But I just pretend like I do. Because right, I was like, oh, okay. She, I looked at her and she says, yes, I always say. I said, why? Right? She says, when I say thank you to Jesus, it tells me I'm helpless. And I'm like, that sounds very deep. I have no idea what you mean by that, right? But I, you know, I, I just held on to it for a little bit. I was like, okay. I didn't get that, that statement until a lot later in my, in my Christian walk. And I want to share with that with you guys a little bit. And it's this ability that when we begin to say thank you, to God, right? When we begin to live a life of actual gratefulness before God, that somehow it transforms the way we react to the world around us, right? It transforms the way we engage with the people around us. It transforms the way we actually, um, it, it transforms our actual faith itself in God by being grateful in every situation, okay? There's something powerful about saying thank you. And something powerful about repeating it over and over and being earnestly, not just in your words, but actually earnestly in your heart, being grateful to God in every situation. Whether you get a promotion, thank you, Jesus. Whether something happened in your family that was very destructive, you have the ability to come in the midst of the pain and say, thank you, Jesus. It has this ability to transform and it taps into the very power of God working into your life, this attitude of gratefulness. And so we're going to try to uh, hit into that today and see what we can learn, okay? And first thing, like, what, what is it that we need to understand as we engage into gratefulness? Go to Psalm 118. Go to Psalm 118. As we read through the Psalm, we're going to read verses 1 through 9, okay? And what we have here is we have a man who is surrounded by his enemies, and instead of kind of asking God for all these things, he begins to proclaim his 
thankfulness towards God and his attitude towards God, right? He proclaims this, this attitude of, of recognizing who God is and um, the beauty of his God. And what we see from there is this transform. we see in his words a, a reality of that trust that he has for God. Look at verse 1 through 9. It says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. And basically, what the psalmist is saying from verse 2 to 3 and 4, he's saying, those who know of your God, those who say that they know their God, would you for a moment sit down and remember that his love endures, not just for a moment, not just for a fleeting time, not just whenever things are good for you or when things are going great for you, but his love for you endures forever. Verse 5, in my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by, set, by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Right? And so here is this guy, okay, who is, who is recognizing something beautiful about his God. Who is telling everyone, remember who your God is. The present circumstances that you are going through, whether it is uh, you lost your job, whether your family is going through a tough time, whether you are having tr- trouble in your relationship, whether your schooling is not turning out to be where it is, whether you are failing your classes, whether your family is broken, whatever the situation you find yourself in, the psalmist is saying, remember your God. All you who fear him, all you who say that you serve him, all you who are his people, Israel, Aaron, those who fear, remember that his love endures forever, right? So when we begin this journey of being grateful, how do we begin to be grateful? What does it do? What, what, what does that, how does that start? And it starts like this. You got to remember that he is good. Not that he does good for you, because that's how we always think about it. We always think that, oh, you know what? God is only going to be, you know, beneficial to me when he does good for me. Right? Now, I'm not saying that he won't do good for you. I'm not saying that he does not desire to do good for you. But the first thing you remember is not the fact that of the blessing, but you remember the blesser. You remember who he is. Who he is. And the psalmist says he is a good God. This is how Jesus did. This is what Jesus did on the table the night before he was crucified. He was having communion with his, uh, with his people. He took the bread. He took the wine. He poured it. He broke it. And he gave what? He gave thanks for it. Do you know what he was saying to himself? This body that I'm about to break, this symbolizes my body that's about to be broken. And I thank you, Jesus, for it. I thank you, Jesus, that I'm about to endure the most painful pain that a, that a nation could ever come up with, the most torturous pain that anyone could ever have conceived in their mind. I thank you that I'm about to face it. As he pours the wine into the glass and he gives it to his disciples, he thanked the Lord for that glass. You know why? Because in that glass he says, this blood, my blood, that's about to be poured out. I want to thank you for it, God. You know why? Because the body that is broken, the blood that is spilled, yes, the present circumstance is painful. But I know that all of this, all of this is for good. Because you are good. What Jesus saw in the middle of being able to give thanks to, uh, in the middle of his, uh, his, his coming crucifixion, what he was able to give thanks for is the fact that he knew that God is good. That this pain that he is going through, the present circumstances of of hurt that he is enduring right now, that is only temporary because there is a greater joy that is coming. There's a greater result that will come out of this painful situation if he is able and willing to walk through it. Now, if you ask me the question, well, how do I, how am I, why would I have to go through this situation, 
PT? Why does God put me in a place where I'm feeling this way? Why does he put me in a place where I feel like I'm crushed? Where I have to be in anguish? Why do he put me in a place where I am so lost and confused and broken? Why? And the answer is I don't know. It really is I don't know. Now, if I tell you an answer, it would just be me making things up, right? I don't know. But what I do know is this. That he works all things for the good of those who love him. Because he is good. He is good. He takes every situation and he folds it into this plan and he works it out for good. And so when you say thank you, when you're saying thank you to God in the middle of that, you know what you're saying? You're saying, I trust you. You're saying that my life is not mine. You're saying that I will not stand and pretend like I know everything. I'm not going to go through this life pretending that I am in control. I recognize that I am helpless. That's what this girl who said thank you to Jesus every single time when things, bad things happen, that's what she understood that I never at that moment can grasp. She recognized that she was helpless before God, and she wanted to be there because she knew that her God is good. And she did not want for a moment to think that she is in control, that she has the power, that somehow she will be the one that will dictate anything. She wanted to ensure and see and recognize that her God is good, that he will deliver us from this, that any present pain and circumstances will be for good. And so you have to imagine this. When we say thank you, when we live our life in gratefulness, what you are doing is you are showing and you are telling the Father, I actually trust you. I'm not just going to pretend and say it with my words, but in my heart, I actually trust you. I trust you that in the middle of this car accident, in the middle of this death, in the middle of this misery, that somehow you will work it out for the good. I don't know how. I can't see how long it will take. But I know that's where and what you will do. And when we have that heart, you know what happens? You know what happens to, to you as you have that heart? He uses you to bring about unbelievable blessing and joy to the world around you. He uses you to be the channel of blessing to those around you because through that trust, he says, this is the daughter and this is the son in whom I will use to show the world that I am real. Because they trust me when everyone else around them tells them it's the dumbest thing to do. They believe me when everyone else around them tells them, do not do that, that is foolish. I will take what is foolish and I will use it for glory. Abraham, who would ever give Abraham the advice to go kill his firstborn son, his most prized son? Who would say, you know what, I, I think that's a good idea. You should go do that, right? If someone comes, if I come up to you one day and I said, you know what, I had a vision from God and God told me to offer up Seth, right? Which one of you would dare come to me and say, hmm, that's a good idea, PT. You go and do that right? You go and do that. I hope none of you would do it. Unless you do, you guys are like, you got messed up, right? Leave this church, right? No one would do that. But Abraham, there was something about God speaking to Abraham, and God was like, and Abraham was like, what? You want me to do what? He was so scared to tell people. The Bible said he left early in the morning. Because can you imagine if he told Sarah, yo, wife, God just told me to kill our son, Right? She'd be like, no, we didn't. <laughs> you stupid. You, get, you stay right here. Right? I'll kill you. You know? You can imagine that. But do you know why Abraham had the ability to do it? To, to even attempt it? Why he even dared to? Was it because it made sense? No. Was it because everyone else around him was like, yeah, go kill him? No. It was because one thing he knew for sure. That God is good. And God promised Abraham through Isaac, and only through Isaac, will I make a nation out of you. So, even if, so Abraham thought, even if I end up killing this kid, God has to bring him back, right? That's all I know. That's all, I mean, he's, he's imagining things. Like, I don't know how, like, maybe the, the, the knife would turn into plastic. I don't, like, they don't even have plastic back then, right? The knife would turn into something and it won't, it won't, it won't kill him. I don't know. But all I know is that Isaac will not die. 
because my God is good. Okay? That's all I know. You see, when we begin to give thanks to God, when you begin to live with an attitude and a heart and a prayer life of thanking God for every situation that you go through, do you know what the result is? Right? The result is he looks into your heart and he says, now I know. Now I know that you love me and that you trust me. Because we all say we trust God, quote, trust God. We all say we believe in God. But the attitude that shows is when we begin to thank God. Not just for good things, but when things are bad. When we can actually stare evil in the face. When we can actually stare brokenness and pain in the face and say, thank you, Jesus. Because I don't know why this is happening, but one thing I know for sure is this. I love you, and I know that you will work all things out for my good in this life or the next. That I know. And when we have that heart, it brings humility to our actions, our attitudes. And all of a sudden he says, I will use you. You are the one that I will use to bring blessing to those around you. Because now I know you love and you trust me that you would not withhold not even your most precious gift from me. Right? So why do we give thanks to God? Why do we do it? Because he is good. He is good in every circumstance, whether it's great and positive or negative and painful. He is good. He is good to you. He is good for you. Right? And when we do that, the result is we begin to be able to tap into this power that God has working in through us. Real, real power, guys. Real things that he uses you for. Because now you, now you enter into the world, and you're not going to think that you're big and mighty. You're not going to think that you are somehow great and awesome. You walk into this world humble and realizing, God, I cannot do it unless you help me. Unless you guide me. You know what's so sweet? Is she here? No, she's not here. Beatrice, right? She's leading praise for our youth group now. You know? And you don't know her. She's like the most timid girl in the world, right? Like, like she would like, you know, she, would, she, would, she would have anxiety attacks in that room right before service. I mean, it's, it's like, I, I used to laugh every time I see her. I mean, it's really mean. I don't, I don't laugh because at her, but I laugh because I know her heart, you know? Because I used to throw up before I preach, like when I first started preaching, for a year straight. Every service. I mean, like, when I was at the old church, they were like, oh, where's PT? In the bathroom, right? Throwing up, you know? And I watch her. And I always tell her, you know, it's, it's, because, it's because you know that you're not ready. That's why now I know you're ready. I start giving her a cryptic word. She's like, what are you saying? Like, if you say you're ready, I know you're not ready. But the fact that you're here and you know you're not ready, I know you're ready. Because every time you finish, you thank God for it. Good or bad, whatever happened up there, you thank God for it. Because you knew that you had no power whatsoever. He uses you to be a blessing to people. Right? That's what gets unleashed. And can you imagine if you, as a people of God, begin to live a life that's actually of gratitude and gratefulness for the things around you, not just for when you get the blessings, but when you also get the pain. Can you imagine what God would use you for? How God would actually work in your life to change and transform and bless people around you, right? So here we are. We start with that, that there is this picture of of God working in us, doing this for us, right? Now here's the second part, okay? How do, we, how do we actually be able to give thanks? Because it's actually kind of hard. Okay? It's kind of hard to say thank you when someone you love has just passed away. Right? It's kind of hard to say thank you when you just got into a car accident and like, you're in the hospital and there's like a $10,000 medical bill that you're about to have to pay. Right? You know, it's kind of hard to say thank you. What is it that moves you towards it? Look at verse 15. So here he was. He, he trusted in his God. He said, better is God to be my helper than anyone else. You know, I take refuge in the Lord, not in men. I take refuge in the Lord, not trust in princes. In verse 15, he says this, Shout, shouts of joy and victory. You know this, uh, let me give you one breakdown of Psalms because you guys might, might not understand it. In Psalms, right, uh, it's a poetry. And so usually when you get a poetry where it starts at one verse and it ends with the exact same verse, the middle verse is the crescendo, right? Is that right? Yeah, the middle verse is like the peak of all of it. So it, go, it, it rises up and it falls back down because 
the psalm, the first verse of the psalm and the last verse of the psalm is exactly the same. So it sandwiches everything in the middle. And that final middle verse, which is verse 15, that is the crescendo. And the crescendo says this, shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. So now that he trusted in his God, he says, better is you. And what did he see? He see victory. He saw that the hand of God actually pulled through. It wasn't just an imaginary thing that he thought, like, you know, everyone tells me to trust God. He trusted in God. He gave thanks to God. He praised his God. And now in verse 15, he realizes the power and the victory that God brings. In verse 16, he says, the Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die now, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. Right? When we give thanks, how do we actually be able to give thanks in the middle of these painful situations? And the way you do it is that you see the joy ahead of you. You see the victory that's already there, right? You know, like, I, I've, I've always imagined, like, people who, when they work out, right, people who are serious about working out, you know, like, when they work out, you, you, don't, you don't really, like, know that things are going well. Unless, unless what? You can actually envision what you will look like after you're done, right? I'm pretty sure that's how it works, okay? That you can actually see your body the way you want it to see. And then all of a sudden, that drives you to this ability to go through the pain and work out, okay? I wouldn't know. I've never been there, right? But, you know, I'm guessing that's how it is, right? In the same way, right? In the same way, victory, you're, you're able to give thanks, enduring thanks, a thankfulness that, that is continuous because you have the ability to envision victory. You have the ability to see glory. You have the ability to see the end of the road. You have the ability to see the gates. Because he says what? These gates are only for the righteous. Only for the righteous. And who are righteous? Those in whom has called upon the name of God. Those who have trusted him in the middle of their suffering and pain. Those whom have said, Lord, you are my salvation and nothing else. And I see now the victory gates waiting for me. And I see now that I will not die, but I will live. I see now that there is whatever pain that came before me is absolutely nothing. And I can endure all of it because now I see the finish line. Right? The best picture I can, I can kind of like illustrate for you guys is the only thing I know about is, you know, our TLC, we, we do Tough Mudder. Right? We do Tough Mudder here. Like every year we do once or twice. Right? And every year after we finish or while we're going through it, Running up the hill, running down the hill, not running, okay, crawling, crawling up the hill, crawling down the hill, gasping for air, dying, right? Every year, maybe it's me, I don't know, maybe I'm just speaking, I always say, never again. <laughs> never again. This is the most painful thing you ever go through. Why would anyone ever do it? And every year my wife said, why? You always tell me never again, but why? Why do you always go back, right? And even this past year, we had all these people do it. And all these people do it. And you know in February, they're going to do it again? Nine of them, they're going to actually sign up again. I'm like, why? Right? And I know why. This happens every single time. You know why? It's because we finished. We finished. And we crossed the victory line. When you cross that victory line, there's something about the euphoric feel of it that makes you forget everything else. Right? That, I mean, whether it's because that beer that comes your way or whatever, it's like a sh- I don't know what it is, but when you cross that victory line, all the stuff that you went through for the past eight hours right, just disappears. All you have left is the moment you've crossed the line, right? And I think the way that people, or at least how dumb we are, is that we forget the pain because all we remember is the victory, right? And that victory allows for us to say, I'll do it again. I'll go through that again. I can go through this pain. I can endure this, right? I can walk through this, crawl through this, Right? How do you give thanks in the middle of all of this issue? How do you give thanks in the middle of all of this hurt and pain? You give thanks because you can see the glory at the end. You give thanks because you can see the victory that is there. 
Do you guys know that your victory is already set for you? Do you guys already know that your glory has already been set for you? If you call God your Savior, if you call Him Father and He is yours and you are His, glory is already yours. There's an author, C.S. Lewis, he once said, if you, right now, if you can see the glory that is already yours, that's in you right now, if, if God at this moment came down and was able to pull that glory out of you, and no matter who you are, you could, be, you could be like the dumbest, wickedest person in this moment at doing the foolish, most foolish things at this moment. If he comes in and the Christ spirit is living in you, he pulls that glory out and you can stare it in the eyes. You can stare at yourself in the eyes. He says, you will be tempted to bow down and worship yourself. Because that was the glory that's yours. All. That's the glory that's in you now. And everything, all of that beforehand, means absolutely nothing if you can see the finish line. You know what awaits for you? Him looking you in the eyes and saying, well done, my good, my faithful servant. Come and enjoy the house of your father. You know what awaits for you? In the midst of all of this stuff that you go through in life, all this pain, right? He comes and he says, welcome home. There's a song that I love. It's called Better Is One Day, right? I remember, like, I, I think I was in college. I was going through some, like, huge emo thing, right? I think I, I, think, I, think I was the year Trisha broke up with me or something. I broke up with you. Well, I was alone. Basically, I was basically alone. We're in college. We're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a ministry that didn't allow us a date. So it was just really horrible. We were just, like, you know, standing there. And I remember things were getting bad. I, like, I was having a struggle with, like, you know, med school and all that stuff. And I was sitting there, and, and the song came up during chapel. It was Better's One Day. And it was, it was a random song. But, you know, sometimes it's just one of those random songs that just hits you. The song just says, Better's One Day in Your Courts, Better's One Day in Your House than a thousand elsewhere. And I remember I stood there and I was singing it and I just realized one day, if I can have one day in the house of God, it will be better than a thousand anywhere else. So why am I here complaining, worrying, and doubting all the situation when my God has already promised me victory? Think about this, guys. Think about this. Envision this. Do you really believe that if God is real, that the Father is real, do you really believe that if he has done all of that, sending his son onto earth, letting his son suffer the pain that he did, going through all of that, for what? To see you come to know him. That he would do all of that to get you to come into his house, now only to abandon you? Now only to leave you helpless? Now only to leave you in a place of brokenness? No. He has pulled you into this. He has called you his own. He has made you his. And the promise is there is victory. And so the walk that you walk through now, the pain that you go through now, the circumstances that you are enduring now, you can be grateful for it because in the end, there is victory. There is victory, and there is glory, but you have to claim it. You have to, and you have to really walk in it. So what is this? How do I give thanks, Tony? Why do, why do I give thanks? When you give thanks, when you begin to give thanks to the Lord, what you are telling him is this. Not only, God, am I just in some sort of weird outside random way saying that you're God, but now I actually am telling you I believe in you. I believe that you are good, that you are for me, not against me. You give thanks because it begins to humble you in such a way where you allow him to use you. Instead of you pushing back with him all the time, saying, God, I know better. I'm smarter. Let me do it my way. But when you begin to say, God, thank you. Thank you for the, for the blessing of this breath. Thank you for the blessing of this heartbeat. Thank you, God, that I know that if you were desired to, I would die in a heartbeat. Thank you for it all, my ups and my downs. When you have that attitude, the humility, you begin to see him working through you. But how do I give thanks always, PT? How do I endure the pain and be able to live a life of great gratitude and gratefulness? You look and you realize something big. Jesus has done it all. He did it all. Your pain was not 
your pain was not a pain that he did not understand. So you can say, if, if, we, if you believe in a God who's never actually stepped on this earth and walked the pain you've walked, then yay, I get it. You can say God's whatever. But you follow after someone who would not find it, who did not find it comfortable for himself to watch you suffer, who was willing to say, I will suffer with you. Whatever temptation that they have gone through, I will go through. Whatever hurt that they feel, I will feel. Whatever loneliness that they have ever encountered, I will encounter it with them. I will do it with them. I will do it for them. Even to the biggest, biggest thing, I will give my life in exchange for theirs. The one price they have to pay, the one thing that they have to pay, I will pay it for them. So that what? So that they will know the joy of the Father. So they will know his love. So they will know that they are cared for. That they are his. I will rip heaven and earth to find you. And he did. And do you really believe that he will leave you now? Do you really believe that at this moment that he will say, just kidding, you're on your own? No. You can live a life of constant gratitude because you already know that he has done all these things for your victory. You will see victory, church. Right? I totally believe if you live long enough, you are under God's word, you are trusting him and you are giving thanks to him, whether it's 50 years from now, 60 years from now, you will be a victorious son and daughter of God. You probably can't see it now. You probably will not be able to see it now because all you see now is your issues, your problem, your pain, your, your distress, your agony. You see your guilt, your shame. You see all those things. But what God sees is his glory in you already. You stand before the Father righteous in his eyes. Do you understand that if, you, if we somehow, if Hurricane, whatever, all those ones just flew over California and we had an earthquake at the same time and we all just die right now and you stand before God, right, he will look at you and you won't, you might feel shame. You might realize, shoot, right before I came to church, mm, that was not smart, right? I wonder if he saw that. He probably did, right? But he, you would stand before him. And if his glory is in you, you know what he will say? Welcome home. My son, my daughter. It's not what you do that defines you. It's what I've already done for you. And when you say thank you, it's you telling me that you understand that. When you say thank you, it's you telling me that you love me. When you say thank you, it's you telling me that you know who you are and who I am. So when you stand before me, I look at you and I say, righteous. Righteous. So my prayers, church, is do that. Would you, would you live a life of gratefulness? Would you live a life that whatever situation you face on the outside or inside, give thanks to God. Give thanks to God for he has victory. Look at, look at the last part. This is what it says in verse 22. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know what that is? That is the very allusion to Jesus Christ. You know, Peter said this. The stone that the world rejected has become the capstone, meaning it's the one thing that holds everything together. That stone that was rejected is the one thing that holds everything together. Let us be glad because you are held together by the Father. You are held together by the Son. And he looks at you and he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Remember me, give thanks to me, be glad in this day, for I have made it, and I've made it for you. Let's pray. You know, as we, let's spend some time in prayer, right, as we respond to God in this word. And let's actually offer a a, uh, a word of prayer for him, a word of thanksgiving, a prayer of thanks. And not just, not, let's not just say it with our lips and our minds, but let's, 
Let's come back. I want you guys to picture something to me, for me. I want you to picture Jesus Christ when he was whipped. I want you to picture Jesus Christ when he had a crowd of people yelling, screaming at him. I want you to picture Jesus Christ in his most empty and lonely state. And I want you to picture the fact that he he went through that to let you know that he understands you. He understands you. And that whatever situation you go through, you can say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because I am not in control. You were rejected. And your resurrection made you the one thing that holds it all together. And I thank you. And I am yours. I thank you. Because I believe and I trust in the fact that you will take all of this and you will make it good. That you will turn this out. So let's pray. Let's come before the Father. Let's give thanks to God for that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God, that you are a good, good, good Father. We thank you, Lord, that you would allow for us, Lord, this, this, this right stand before you. We thank you, God, that you have given to us life and breath. We thank you, Lord, for the situations that we go through, though we do not understand, though we cannot fathom, though we cannot comprehend. Why? The only thing that we have assurance in is the knowledge and the truth that you would give your life for us. That you are good. That we are going through this not for our condemnation and for our own personal suffering, but we are going through this and you will take it Yes, Father God, we will feel the pain of it. Yes, Father God, we will feel the hurt of it. We will will endure the pain with hope. We will endure the hurt with hope. We will endure, Father God, the struggle with hope. Because you have done all good things. We trust in you. We walk with you. And we surrender to you. So, Father, we come before you and we want to just give you praise. Thank you, Jesus, that you have given your life as a ransom for ours. Thank you that we have the ability to live in the world that we live in. Thank you, God, for the blessings upon blessings that we have that so many do not. Thank you, God, that you have allowed for us to overcome or endure through these struggles and these trials that some of us might be going through. Because we know that, Father God, through these trials, you will take them, you will mold them, you will shape them ultimately for our good because we are yours and you will never leave us where we are at. And so my prayer, God, is you would take us as a whole. That you would, Father God, bring us together now and help our eyes be fixed upon you. Humble our hearts to remember in every situation and all things to give thanks to you. We praise you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name.